Good evening, everybody, and welcome to CERLAC and to our second Batista Forum for 2021. We're excited about the forum tonight. The title is Critical but Expendable Migration, Securitization, and Racialization in Unequal Nation States. I just want to mention a couple of housekeeping items. You'll note that the chat is on now so that you can look at the program and also the bios of our wonderful panelists. But we are going to disable the chat in a minute um, until after the panelists finish. And then we're asking you to ask your questions by pressing the Q&A button and entering your question at the bottom of the at the bottom of the screen. Alejandro Mayoral is an indigenous activist and scholar working on issues around digital decol decoloniality and decolonial computing and he's going to be here giving our land acknowledgement tonight. He also works on critical race uh, he's a critical race coder and developer. You can tell that I'm a geriatric and this language is somewhat unfamiliar to me. His work aims at creating bridges across indigenous youths to bring digital applications to different communities and groups in Canada and Mexico. Alejandro is a PhD candidate in communication studies at York and we're delighted that he's gonna start us off tonight. Alejandro. Thank you. A land, land acknowledgement involves making a statement recognizing the traditional territory of the indigenous peoples who called the land home before the arrival of settlers. In many cases, they still call it home. Indigenous peoples have been acknowledging the land at the start of ceremonies, gatherings, and events for the time immemorial. More than ever, in the context of online work, that land reclamation requires to continue to happen also in digital spaces. That's why York University and CERLAC recognize that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of the institution. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Toronto has been taken care of by the Nishnabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and many Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the dish with one, what, uh, sorry, the dish uh, with one spoon, one pound belt covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Providing a land acknowledgement at the beginning of this event gives time for reflection and demonstrates recognition of indigenous lands treaties and peoples. It involves thinking about what happened in the past around migration and what changes can be made going forward in order to further the decolonization processes. The national migration policies of countries such as Canada and the United States continue replicating the violence of colonization and power structures over indigenous nations and communities across Latin America and the Caribbean. Land acknowledgements mark a small but an important step in the process of land proclamation and building a positive relationship with indigenous peoples. By making an active reflection on the land acknowledgement, you are taking part in the act of decolonization, honoring the land and indigenous present that dates back over 30,000 years. Using and participating in land acknowledgement is a way to recognize the enduring present and resilience of indigenous peoples in this area for time immemorial. They are also a reminder, a reminder that we are all accountable for these relationships. Therefore, it's crucial to be informed on the past and ongoing consequences of colonization. I encourage everyone to learn about the history of these lands and to support indigenous resistance here and across the continent. Thank you, Alejandro. the land acknowledgement seems particularly appropriate tonight when we're going to be talking about the conditions of migrant workers here on the land in Toronto, uh, not in Toronto, in Ontario. 
and um, and also just to remind people that we're all governed by particular treaties um, with indigenous people here in Canada. I don't know for United States um, or I don't actually even know for Trinidad, but um, so it's important to remember um, what the terms of those treaties are. Uh, I just want to note that um, there will be an event um, at, at um, a bookstore in Santa Ana, Carola, California in the US. And it's an event at Libro Mobile. And um, uh, it's gonna be an event with native writers speaking out, Erica Worth and David Heska Wanbley Wyden will be special guests. And we're all invited to join them um, at IG uh, TV at Libromobile on Saturday, March 13th. Thank you very much, Honor. Uh, and thank you everyone. Good evening to all for attending our panel today. Special thanks to our panelists who kindly accepted our invitation to reflect and share their thoughts in a variety, but ultimately interconnected dimensions of migration in Canada, the US and the Caribbean region. When the organizing committee considered the possible ways in which to conceptually frame this panel, we came across a series of critical themes that have characterized the experience of immigrants in Central and North America and the Caribbean region. But we also considered states' responses to the increasing flow of immigrants' communities to these regions. First, the polarizing and criminalizing attitudes towards immigrants that inform policy decision making today. Second, the increased levels of the increased levels of securitization and racialization of immigrants of immigration across international borders. And third, the seeming expendability through which public authorities and corporate actors have treated and still treat seasonal agricultural farm workers and other precarious laborers that move along transnational borders seeking a decent livelihood. Critical but expendable is the expression that coined by York professor Kamala Campadu to refer to this hypocritical official response to the plight of essential transnational workers. Our panel this evening will bring together speakers from non-governmental and activist organizations as well as academics and grassroots community members working on, a diff on the different dimensions of immigration in Canada, the US and the Caribbean region. I feel honored each one of you accepted our invitation. And allow me to briefly introduce each of our panelists and the order they will speak today. First is Dr. Evelyn Encalada Gress. Dr. Encalada is a transnational labor scholar community labor organizer and assistant professor in labor studies and sociology and anthropology at Simon Fraser University in Canada. She is the co-founder of the award-winning collective Justice for Migrant Workers, J4MW, that has advocated for the rights of migrant farm workers in Canada for two decades. Then is Chris uh, Ramsarup. Chris is an organizer with, with just Justicia for Migrant Workers as well. And he's also an instructor in the Caribbean Studies program at the University of Toronto and a clinic instructor at the University of Windsor in the Faculty of Law. Chris is working to complete his PhD at, at OIC in the University of Toronto. Third is Dr. Angelique V. Nixon from the University of West Indies, St. Augustine, Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Nixon is a Bahamas born Trinidad based writer artist and scholar activist. She's a lecturer and, uh, and graduate studies coordinator at the Institute for Gender and Development Studies at the West Indies, St. Augustine. Her research and teaching areas include Caribbean and post-colonial studies, African diaspora literatures, gender and sexuality studies, tourism, diaspora studies, and transnational migrations. And finally in our panel today is Dr. Manuel Galaviz, from the University of Texas at Austin in the US. Dr. Galaviz earned his PhD in sociocultural anthropology from the University of Texas at Austin in December, 2020. His ethnographic research examines the racial uh, and spatial implications of US border security militarization 
and transportation infrastructures on Mexican and Chicana communities in San Diego, California. Without further ado, I invite Dr. Encalada Gress to speak to the audience. And the title of her uh, talk tonight is Status or Status Quo, Migrant Farm Workers in a Time of COVID. La Lucha Continua. Thank you. OK, thank you so much. Um, I hope that uh, technology will be on our side uh, for the rest of um, this time together. Um, thank you to Miguel and to Honor and uh, for inviting and convening this panel and everybody else who made this time possible. I'm going to share my screen, but I don't know at this point if I have those capabilities. Um, so I will see, yeah, host disabled. So can somebody give me those extra powers, please? It should work for you now. Okay, um, this is the title of my presentation, um, but basically I'm going to be offering you some thoughts that I'm still processing, witnessing um, how the pandemic has, um, has implicated or impacted the lives of migrant workers that is still ongoing. And just right now, a migrant worker just sent me a picture of herself completely covered um, on the way back to, to Canada on a plane. And so, um, this is definitely work and witnessing in process and in progress. Um, firstly, I also wanted to acknowledge because I'm in the west part, the, the west coast of Canada. I wanted to acknowledge the Squamish, um, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Quiquitlam and the Muskegon peoples of these lands where I now inhabit as a settler. And of course, we have to um, align ourselves as much as possible with the ongoing struggles for decolonizations wherever we find ourselves. First, I wanted to give an overview of the programs that I'm talking about. Uh, for those of you who are new um, to this topic, basically um, they are, there are two main programs for agricultural work in Canada. The first one is one of the flagship programs um, that was started in 1966 with a group of Jamaican workers through a memorandum of understanding between the government of Jamaica and Canada. Then in 2002, the Canadian government expanded um, who uh, could actually come through uh, this pathway of disposability through the NOC C and D program for the agricultural stream. And it has a very long title. We don't like it as researchers, it's too long, but it's the NOC C and D for, um, for agriculture that basically catches other workers from different parts of the world beyond the SAW program that is mostly different parts of the Caribbean and Mexico. Um, what, is, um, what is very, very um, concerning about these programs is that there are embedded government immigrant restrictions. Workers have an employment contract with only one employer and workers come here to Canada as workers, not um, with their families because the less uh, social obligations they have in the country, the better they are at producing the profits that is expected of them um, in this multi-billion dollar agricultural industry that they're embedded in. And employers have the power to repatriate at any moment. So in many ways, the employer becomes not just the employer, the boss that dictates how um, the work is done at the greenhouse in the fields, but the employer also becomes the very real and, the, and a de facto immigration official that decides who gets to leave, who gets to return, and also the landlords, because in many of these programs, the majority of workers have to live in the premises of their employers. And then there's another group um, that is also part of this labor force um, that include undocumented workers or tourist overstayers. Um, and importantly um, to note is that there is about yearly, at least in 2018, Stats Canada reported that, um, that the agricultural industry basically is worth $62.4 billion. So there's a lot of interest behind um, this program and behind um, the labor model um, that has been structured to feed um, to feed all of these profits. 
And so there's a lot of vested interests to keep this labor model of basically on freedom for migrant workers in place. The majority of migrant workers are from Mexico, Guatemala, who are mostly Mayan workers from different Mayan ethnicities and Jamaica. And the, the provinces where they are concentrated the most is first Ontario, Quebec, and then in this province, British Columbia. And I'm just gonna take you through a little quick voyage of um, some rural landscapes or the lives of migrant workers through some um, pictures that I have collected over the years. And some of them are actually on the Justice for Migrant Workers Facebook page, so they're publicly available. But basically I wanted uh, to start with this picture that is um, a very ideal picture of what the rural looks like. And this is Ontario. But then last, landscapes are not neutral. Landscapes hide a lot. We always have to ask ourselves, who has always been there? How was the land tamed and who tamed the land? And how were they treated? And, um, and the land basically is an invitation for us to uncover hidden histories. And the land in rural Ontario or rural Ontario hides and conceals so much. Um, well, and this is one image that I took when I first started going to Leamington with Chris. We are the co-founders of Justice for Migrant Workers. And basically this is what, these are the images that migrant workers have to contend with. So here, um, a supposedly a, Lexi, a, a lazy Mexican taking a, a nap uh, beside a cactus. So it's very infantilizing, very dehumanizing. And the last thing that of course any worker is gonna be doing is, um, is, you know, is taking a break in these greenhouses that are now even monitored uh, technologically to, um, to basically keep track of how fast workers are in a particular line within the greenhouses. But it just shows, you know, the, the different types of stereotypes that migrant workers are subjected to. Um, and then here, um, this is an image um, that um, Justicia for Migrant Workers, uh, we collected over year, the years um, as a collective, but it's basically a shower, a shower stall. And all that debris that you see there is sewage. So this is sewage would actually back up when um, workers would take a shower after a long day's work. And, um, and then we have to ask ourselves, would Canadians be expected to live in a place like this? Um, but um, it's because it's migrant workers from the global south that are assumed to just um, are able to adapt to whatever conditions they're given because many times what employers will say is is that whatever they're given in Canada is much better that they're is much better than their home countries um, in X, Y, and C um, countries. So they constantly make excuses for the horrible conditions that they expect migrant workers to contend with on a daily basis. And this is a sign that just shows how much uh, migrant workers are controlled in rural spaces. So imagine, um, you know, your employers also dictating what you would do after work. Um, so here there is a sign in Spanish and it appeared in English in the housing of Jamaican workers in this particular farm that there is a security company patrolling the area ensuring that migrant workers comply with curfew for visitors during the week and on the weekends. And then speaking of controlling, um, this is a sign, um, or this is a picture that I took in this housing unit with um, that housed primarily Mexican migrant women. And then this farm also housed and, had hi and hired, used to hire Jamaican men. And so this sign was for the Jamaican men to basically stay away um, from Mexican women. And it was, you know, very eerie because I worked at a hardware store and I've never seen a sign of this sort whatsoever. So obviously the employer went out of his way to make this sign um, as a way to control any intimacy between uh, Mexican migrant women and Jamaican male workers. And so at nighttime, there was also this light, um, those lights that, you know, that turn on when there is a body that passes through, right? Like those sensory lights. And so this is the type, this is the level of control. It's at the level of sexuality, of the body, of intimacy um, that 
that farmers assert over the labor force, which would be unconscionable for any other workplaces among citizen workers. And this is just um, an image of some of the housing conditions that we've been um, organizing around for the last 20 years. And, um, and so these are images that are also very, quite new. So how could you actually do physical distancing in a space of this sort? And in Canada, a supposed developed first world country. And imagine like how high the actual bunk beds are and how crammed they are. And this is a very interesting sign that I, I don't always show to just any audience, um, but this is basically, what this is, is a shower, um, no, sorry, a washroom stall. Um, and I was so curious because, you know, once, you know, in this particular farm that I used to go to all the time, this was my first time asking to go to um, the, you know, to the ladies room. And, um, and so I couldn't believe my eyes, but every single stall had the sign that said Jamaican, 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 or Mexican. The whole entire uh, bathroom was segregated racially in this way. Um, and then the, what the problem here is, is that um, when workers are constantly pinned against each other in the workplace and then they go home or they go and rest in their housing, you can't really call these housing units homes, um, then they're further segregated. And that's how all this labor from migrant workers are further extracted to this divide through this divide and conquer through this divide and conquer type of tactics that um, continue on when they are supposedly resting um, after work. And these are some images that migrant workers sent me uh, um, in response to uh, this campaign that Loblaws had recently of them basically celebrating um, the farmers who are feeding. Um, Canadians during the pandemic, but they featured all of these farming families that were white, devoid completely of the of the black and brown bodies, workers um, who are the backbone and who are the ones that are producing the real value and who are con who are producing the, the actual food that makes it onto our tables and the food that is also exported for profit and exported for further processing. Um, so what we have seen um, during COVID-19 um, and migrant workers, so all of these images, and you know, of course there's much more to say, but I'm trying to be conscious of the time and uh, the space that we all have today together, is, um, is that during COVID, all of the vulnerabilities that we've been organizing against and trying to um, change um, for the migrant population with the migrant population uh, through um, a multifaceted strategy using the law, using public campaigns, public awareness, so on and so forth. There has been more control over their mobility unlike ever before. So in some farms, um, workers were expected to be in quarantine the whole entire season. So this was this was definitely beyond the 14 days that is required legally and um, that is required um, in accordance to health officials. Um, and um, there was also reprisals here in, in British Columbia that were very public. Jesus and Erika, there are two workers from Mexico who ended up asking for culturally appropriate food during their time when they couldn't even leave to go to the to their local to the local community um, to town to buy the things that they're used to. Um, and they received all of these goods and support from this organization that um, we're very that we work very closely with, Rama. And they were repatriated, deported as a result of receiving um, these supports. Um, and then the mental health issues, if workers have been, um, if workers go through all of this isolation and anxiety that mostly they call nervios, um, well, this year, because they were more isolated, their mental health issues was suffering unlike ever before. Actually, this this since March has been the worst season for migrant workers since the entirety of the of the whole history of the seasonal agricultural workers program since 1966. 
And what we saw is that also workers had to make that decision with their family. Are they gonna come back to Canada and risk dying? Or are they gonna stay home in countries where there's not a solid social safety net and risk um, not being able to pay their bills, not being able to put food on the table? And so they had very limited options and them coming here to Canada is basically putting their lives at risk more than ever. And as a result, what we saw in Ontario, um, where there's been the most mismanagement of COVID-19, um, is that three Mexican workers died as a result of COVID. And the big problem with the huge problem here has been um, housing and how primarily uh, employers, um, they use migrant workers to subsidize the agricultural um, industry. And so they don't want to spend a lot of money on housing workers and they cram workers usually in very small spaces. And we knew that that was going to be a problem. And that is what has proper, propagated um, COVID-19. COVID and so, and here's um, his, um, uh, his, Jesus and Erika. And how has the government responded? Well, the government um, always places the onus on, on employers and on growers to do the good thing. And um, so what they did is that um, in the height of the pandemic, um, the Canadian government um, gave um, $50 million to growers to, um, to accommodate and adjust the housing as much as possible. And, um, and also to cover some of the wages for migrant workers to do the 14 um, day quarantine. But we heard different and uneven um, regulations in effect from migrant workers themselves. Some migrant workers didn't even do 14, 14 days of quarantine. They were sent to work in the fields right away. And we're, we are asking where exactly did those $50 million go? $50 million actually go, but it shows how migrant workers or how employers always side with um, employers and always side with their interests. And one thing that I was taught by my professors at York University, um, Eduardo Canel, Lisa North, is about you know, how much power rural land, loan or land um, holders actually have in Latin America. But what I've seen throughout the last 20 years with migrant workers is the huge lobbying power that the agricultural industry has. And so for me, they function very similarly like the latifundistas that, you know, that we studied um, in Latin American studies. And how the government also responded, and I see that I'm, uh, I have to um, stop really quickly. Correct. Okay. Is that um, the government also responded by expanding the seasonal agricultural workers program instead of implementing structural changes like status, which we've been um, asking for. And just really quickly, I'm going to go through these slides and end on my last points, but this is another way that government or employers have responded by um, providing this type of food to, to migrant workers that is completely inappropriate in so many respects, including nutritiously. Um, and, and then what is really important for us moving forward is how, is how to understand these programs um, as a continuation of Canada as a white settler society where immigrants, migrants have always been used to basically uh, build the nation, but never be a part of the nation. And what we see is a continuation of an ongoing racialization of black, brown bodies through labor and immigration policies. And now that I live here in BC, one of my friends from Migrante, Migrante BC, Chris Sorio, took me to um, these canneries, uh, this, these historic canneries. And I saw this bunkhouse that said Chinese bunkhouse. And, almost, and it's, it was like, I almost had a visceral experience of thinking about all of the housing, the segregated housing that I've seen for 20 years, and then to see that they also have existed since the 1900s here in Canada. So what we need uh, right now is we need to create more noise around the need for status, because we have to ask ourselves, is this the end of migration for Latin Americans and Caribbeans? 
are, are people only going to be allowed to come into the country as, as uh, commodities that continuously subsidize a multi-billion industries? And right now, as an organizer and as a researcher, I think that not calling for status for migrant workers in all the spaces that uh, we occupy with our multiple roles, not calling for status for migrant workers right now and beyond is complete betrayal for, my, for them, for migrant workers, and their families. And that's just, you know, some of the work that we've been doing, primarily Elizabeth Ha, um, we've, all, we've been doing what, I think what we're also trying to do is retejendo, tejendo nuestra comunidad, um, basically putting our community back together again, uh, digitally, and by working with other organizations like Food Share to deliver food that is culturally appropriate and that is gonna keep migrant workers, those who feed us, from not going hungry themselves here in Canada. So I look forward to your Q&A. Sorry that I went so fast, but uh, thank you so much. <laughs> That's it for now. Thank you very much, Dr. Encalada. Really, um, I just wanted, want to emphasize to uh, everyone uh, to use the Q&A section on your screen. We will keep, uh, and hold your questions. We're gonna keep a track of them. And then uh, at the end of, uh, when everyone in the panel speaks, we're going to look at your questions. Uh, thank you. Our next uh, panelist is Chris Ransarup, and the title of his presentation is COVID-19 Crisis and Migrant Farm Workers. A hidden crisis exposed, or are we scratching the surface of Canada's apartheid state? Chris, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be uh, brief, maybe about 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes. Um, and I think mythology, it plays a central role uh, in how we, um, how COVID has come to define migrant workers, how COVID has come to define um, agricultural industry and the quote unquote crisis, both in labor and, and in our food security system, our food system. And the mythology, I guess a couple, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, Political Blind Date, that TV show approached me uh, and they're like, look, we want to have you guys on the show. And I was like, not interested, didn't want to, but maybe I was actually wrong. Um, as some of you might have seen, it was on TVO a couple of days ago, and there's a poignant mo moment where the conservative MP, um, his name's not important, but he talked about his roots. He's a farmer, three or four generations of a farmer, uh, Ukrainian roots, came to Canada as sharecroppers, and they were able to, to lay a foundation here within rural Ontario, where they, of course, became landowners themselves. And these um, employers are talking about you know, the mythology of them, you know, building the land, building the landscape, building society, creating infrastructure, creating jobs. And part of this mythology, of course, erases, as Evelyn said, racialized people, indigenous communities have been toiling this land for thousands of years. All this is erased uh, as a result of the so-called uh, sharecroppers who came. But that mythology is also really important for two aspects here. The idea, and remember what I said, these sharecroppers came and they were able to live as permanent residents. Let's move to the 1960s, when agricultural workers from Jamaica and Trinidad and Barbados started coming to Canada. They did not have that luxury. They did not have that ability. When they started coming, the mythology and the idea that they somehow were different, that they were subordinate, that they couldn't handle these perceived stereotypes about climate, they were a threat to the Canadian state because of their racialized bodies, the idea of civil strife, being associated with their color of their skin, the idea of violence, the idea of only being able to pick and not being equal members of society, all were fundamental roles in creation of the 1960 guest worker program, the seasoned agricultural worker program. So very much we saw a very different dichotomy where white settlers were able to stay here. Racialized workers were only seen as expendable labor that must return. Now, it's a lot more powerful for us to just think about just that workers aren't guest workers returning from one part of the state to another. It's a continual sense of limbo that workers have to face, not only while in Canada, but home. There is no real home, is there? Some time is spent in their Trinidad or Jamaica or Mexico or Guatemala, but in fact, most time is spent here. So the mythology of temporariness, that this idea that workers are temporary. So in fact, that they cannot be engaged in political, civil, social, economic forms of enf enfranchisement. So they, we find ways to construct them and disenfranchise them through this notion and idea of, of a temporariness. 
We create these temporary work permits, temporary status, and as, as such, that also extends to different forms of labor protections, where we see seasonal workers and agricultural workers uh, very much denied basic rights as other workers. The second part of the mythology, getting to our food crisis and uh, the, the, the labor crisis that, you know, and for all of our peoples, whether it's the Bracero program, whether we're talking about the plantation economies of the Caribbean or Canada, uh, the results of slavery, genocide, indentureship, the plantation class have always claimed that there is a labor shortage. And a labor shortage is also a mythology. And throughout COVID, we saw what this meant. Uh, when Canada, through Justin Trudeau, decided to close the borders in March of last year, the employers created this mythology of the Canadian rural farmer that was losing their crops, their livelihoods, their mental well-being. Everything was at stake because agricultural workers from the global south were not permitted to help with the export production of our food system. As some of you might know, most of the crops for migrant works, workers on uh, is for export production. So this mythology, the small farmer, uh, prior to the Prime Minister of Canada coming to speak on national television, CBC and CTV would, would basically point out and go to talk to these farmers just before the Prime Minister comes on to talk about their plight. So great lobbying, great PR work, but it was much more powerful. So the response to this incredible lobbying by the employer class, the plantation owners, uh, was to create and say that, look, there is an exception that agricultural workers from the Caribbean, from the Philippines, from Central America and Mexico were quote unquote essential workers. And the other stereotype of the essential worker as we know is that of people who work in healthcare, people who are firefighters, people who are highly unionized, well-paid. And this facade and this idea of a facade of an essential worker was used to permit agricultural workers to come and we saw no difference in their conditions. We saw no hazard pay, we saw no reinforcement about occupational health, we saw no paid sick days. The continued expendability where workers were uh, came to work and in many cases and during the height of pandemic we saw workers being repatriated for trying to stand up for the rights or even getting sick. Now albeit we have a status of three workers who've died. In fact I'm going to argue that we really do not know how many workers have died, how many workers have been sick, and how many workers have gone home sick um, and what's happened to those workers after. The Figure that we have is 2,200 workers in Ontario alone um, that have been sick, but now the information that used to be public doesn't exist anymore. So data collection is also a huge problem in our organizing work. So the mythology of the farm, the family farm, to mask and shield the idea of, um, of a corporate agricultural plantation society. The myth of a labor shortage to ensure that racialized our peeps are coming to Canada to, wonder, to work under indentured conditions, okay? And the mythology of a food system um, that's been in perpetual crisis as a result of trade agreements, as a result of uh, domination, both American and Canadian domination of, of, of an imperialist system of agriculture that has us competing and trying to subordinate peoples of the global South. So in effect, our agricultural system is based on um, uh, game shop or all the all the this, um, the, the short sellers, the, the the financial markets, this financialization, and we're gambling with our food system rather than providing and protecting our communities. So um, and just to, to to highlight what Evelyn said earlier too. So in the height of this crisis, rather than the government uh, taking the necessary steps to protect workers, to engage in the, in this idea of of the you know investing to protect all people. What we saw was the expansion of the seasonal agricultural worker programs to different commodities. This is the first in decades. And we've also seen that Canada's presence on the international global market has expanded um, through this pandemic. So the growers are making money off of this. The Canadian government's making money off of the racialized labor forces. So that's also really, really incredible for us to, to understand. And then the second correlation part of this for myself is looking at the surveillance state and how migrant farm workers are continually surveilled. Of course, through the work permit, the fact that you're tied to an employer, that there is no labor social or social mobility, that your movements are restricted from working from other places is one component. Uh, ask me about the DNA case in the Q&A, please, y'all. Okay, I can't forget about the DNA issue. So that's another form of surveillance. The biometrics and the way that uh, racialized bodies are differently managed by a biometric system where some countries have to provide a biometrics to, to arrive in Canada and other countries do not. Um, it started with Jamaica, 
of course, right? We had to racialize Jamaicans differently from everybody else. And then it's now has been extended to all the other um, co countries uh, in the global South. And during, during the height of this bloody crisis, what we saw were several other things that's really important for us to understand. To protect the commodity, to protect profits, migrant workers, uh, movements in the community were confined and they continue are to this day. And what I mean by that is farm workers have perpetual curfews. They cannot leave the farm. If they leave, they get terminated. They get told that they can't return. Uh, they have to um, pay for their own hotel to quarantine. I kid you not, they're going to have to pay for their own quarantine time to go, uh, if they decide to go buy groceries, go get personal protective equipment, get whatever stuff that they need, um, which is outrageous. It's absolutely outrageous. Uh, their movements are, are confined. And um, the onus and the blame and the responsibility has fallen onto the workers. And I'll cite three different examples of this. So first is um, recently the federal government's announced that workers um, who have to, most people have to come to Canada with a negative test. And for the farm workers, we are getting, receiving reports that people are paying up to $350, uh, money that they don't have to pay to prior to arriving here in Canada. Uh, other workers are telling us that their deductions are coming off their wages. And I want you to think about this. So a worker is making less than minimum, well, about minimum wage, let's say 1410 or 1420. And all these tremendous uh, deductions that are coming from their, from, their, from their salaries. In fact, this government program, really workers are working for less than minimum wage. Uh, number two, the vector of the virus. Migrant workers continuously are seen as the ones bringing the virus to Canada. And we've constructed such closed borders in a way to say that you have to reach such a high threshold before arriving without any thought that the majority, the overwhelming, and I'm talking 99% of the workers received COVID here in Canada for two reasons, community contacts, uh, working conditions, and associated with working conditions are congregate housing, as Evelyn said. And this vilification um, most recently, and um, a lot of us have been quite vocal about this, uh, is how surveillance and criminalization are occurring within these communities. The main culprits are quote unquote undocumented communities in rural Ontario. So we're seeing heightened demands for police enforcement, uh, border agent enforcement. Uh, we are seeing hostilities and, and a lot of hysteria about the undocumented body in rural Ontario. Now, if you don't know about rural Ontario and migrant workers, people go they, they shift between different immigration statuses. Some people are temporary foreign worker one day, they may lose status for whatever reasons. So in effect, when they're really talking about targeting the undocumented bogeyman, they're talking about all racialized, bo racialized bodies in those type of spaces. So we've seen um, the idea of essential labor to bring migrant workers to Canada who are subordinated. Once here in Canada, they're not provided with protections. We've seen heightened surveillance and criminalization and the enforcement of the state to ensure that they do not leave their farms, which creates a whole hell of a mess. But the beauty part of the story, and I know you're probably saying, what the hell, why am I using the word beauty? And the fundamental thing that I think our communities, you know, through narratives for generations, I've always talked about resistance. And through the most toughest times, through the control, control of the state, through the power of the growers, through this extremely insurmountable time that we're facing here, um, our comrades are finding multiple ways to fight back. Now, at the height of the first crisis, um, Professor um, Honor Fort Smith, Professor Alyssa Trotz, and a lot of peeps were really, really critically important in trying to get this message out to people um, in the Caribbean. And one of the messages we got out was from a worker who worked on a farm in Greenhill um, in Chatham, Ontario. And that worker felt it was pretty, pretty important for him, for the world to know of what was going on. So he used his narrative as a shared narrative to talk about what he faced, what needs to be done, and why he was defiant in the wake of a crisis. Throughout this crisis, workers have been going through to WhatsApp, going through Messenger, going through other forms of social media platforms to share information, not just to expose, but to organize, to organize with workers across other farms, across other provinces, across other regions. Uh, a brother of mine named Clinton, on his own, he uh, took a video to show about some of the housing conditions he faced, and that went viral. Um, and his idea, he was back home, but he was to talking to power. He was trying to show that, yes, you've tried to put 
put, put restrictions on my movement, but I would like the world to know about our conditions and to create changes for housing situations. Justicia members, as Evelyn, and I'm gonna try to shut up the next two minutes. I hope I haven't gone too much, too far. Uh, Justicia members like Elizabeth Hoff, Jade, Elizabeth Mondale, Gabriel Aladua, all these people have basically been out there doing food. And the act of food and providing food is not a form of charity for us. It's a form of solidarity. It's a form of organizing and exposing the hypocrisy of our food system where the people provide food are going hunger because of the restrictions that are placed on their movement. So it's an organizing tool and it's a power tool. We've been engaging in different forms of legal actions. We've been doing card care events. And to end, I want to talk about something else that's phenomenal. Now, my role as an organizer isn't a traditional organizer. I don't even think I'm a really good organizer in the first place or an academic or anything. Uh, but what I am is a storyteller and I'm able to share stories that I'm hearing from other workers. And throughout this crisis, what we've seen is, is a take up of, of wildcat strikes, of resistance, a peak of walking off. Uh, there was one at Martin's Farms in, in London, close to London, Ontario, when there was a COVID outbreak. A lot of the workers said, no, we're not going to go back to work because you haven't taken the necessary precautions to protect our workers and ourselves and our bodies. So they actually stood up and fought against our boss. In October, a group of workers at Cervini Farms in, in the Windsor, Essex area, they organized a wildcat strike. Wide strike. It was a multiracial of all the workers there. And it was around chemical conditions. And they fought back and they won. Recently, the company tried to once again, um, tried to, this, really, this really, really terrible chemical that burns your skin, burns your body. All the workers were complaining. So these workers took to social media. They basically asked for solidarity. And the community they came together. And through a lot of this, this, this acts of resistance, within a day or two of going public, those chemicals were gone as a result of those workers. So in spite of the hypocrisy, in spite of this power of white domination, a narrative and a mythology of agricultural dominance, um, workers are trying to create cracks in a system that's unfair. And this is based on our long history of resistance, but it's also adapting to the conditions that are happening in rural Ontario and across rural spaces across the continent. So my time I want to take to honor all the Justicia people who've been out there fighting and to my comrades, those sisters and brothers on the, on the front lines who are working through hell to put food on our table and to feed their families home. I send my love, I send my support, and we'll do whatever we can to be there for you. Thank you. Peace. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you. Um, there are already a few questions you have received, you and, and Evelyn. I hope that you can see that in the question and answer section. We're gonna leave up, uh, we're gonna leave the question at the end. So just mindful of the time we got disconnected, some of us, so we started a little bit late, um, but we're catching up. And I think what uh, what we've been doing is, is amazing and um, the presentations are, re are really, really great. Um, next is uh, Dr. Angelique Nixon, uh, and uh, Dr. Nixon is the Graduate Studies Coordinator at the Institute of Gender and Development Studies at the West Indies um, University in St. Augustine, and uh, she will be speaking about the politics of South-South migration in the Caribbean. Dr. Nixon, please. Hi, just to, uh, to update my bio, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if you didn't get my latest bio. I'm a lecturer at the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, um, not Graduate Studies Coordinator anymore. So just correcting that. Hi, everyone. So I'm gonna dive in. I don't have a presentation, but I might wanna share a few images. I don't wanna take too much time because I know folks are wanna get to the, to the Q&A. So I wanted to reflect today in the context of this conversation on migratory flows in the region with a focus on how we think about this idea of South-South migration and some of the transnational impacts of xenophobia and structural violence. I also want us to think today, and I wanted to reflect on how many times we call out the mistreatment of migrants in the global North. Uh, we've seen and heard already today of how Caribbean migrants, what they're experiencing in terms of violence, in terms of ill treatment. 
we do that and we have those conversations. Uh, but when we talk about and think about regional migration politics, uh, I argue that there's a myriad of contradictions and hypocrisies that arise and that some of these actually mimic the same xenophobic attitudes and deportation policies uh, that happen in North America. And these issues are really further complicated and exacerbated with the economic and climate crises and as the region grapples with the COVID-19 global pandemic as all of us are. And so I wanted us to think and I want to talk a little bit today about how we are managing these various kinds of disasters and how long standing problems multiply and are exacerbated and even really exposed during moments of crisis. And for us in the region, in addition to the economic crisis, the COVID-19, the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and all that it's wrought in terms of economic challenges, the rise in gender based violence as a result of that has been startling as it has been globally. And so migration, of course, when we think about migration being fueled through economic, social and political and climate crises become even more difficult to manage as we grapple with multiple and complex challenges. And so migrants and refugees then become really easy targets and scapegoats as countries shore up national borders, but yet rely on migrant labor as we are discussing today. And we treat migrants as pariah and disposable. And as the framework for our conversation today, and Professor Kempadu has given us the frame of critical but expendable. And in my work, I've been thinking about how we have to unravel the ways that vi gender based violence and other forms of violence intersect with violence towards migrants, in particular at the intersections of class, race and gender. And when we think about how de deportees are treated as they are sent back from places in the global north into the region. Many times to places they might never have considered home or haven't considered home for a very long time. Sometimes migrants who were born, migrants, uh, children of migrants even being deported. That of and in itself thinking about it as a form of violence and then how deportees then are able to and in many ways struggle to figure out how do I build a life in this place, the challenges they face upon returning. So I, thinking about all of these as the, the broader landscape of inhumane treatment and the violation of people's human rights that become a part of the xenophobic landscape and an even acceptable treatment of migrants around the world. And for us in the region, as we think about being on the front lines of climate change and small island disasters, mass migration and devastation are happening already with COVID-19. The pandemic is, a, is on top of disaster upon disaster. When we think about what happened in the Bahamas and in my own uh, work and analysis of thinking about how Haitian migrants were, what they experienced, the double, triple uh, marginalization after Hurricane Dorian, the massive amounts of deportation that happened all the time from the Bahamas to Haiti from Dominican Republic to Haiti, from Trinidad uh, to Guyana, from Trinidad to Venezuela. There's so many movements of this framework of thinking about how migrant labor is used and how migrants are treated. And then when we think about the movements across the region because of, because of climate crisis, because of disasters after hurricanes and earthquakes, that just adds so many different layers to our conversation today. I'm also thinking about these contradictions and xenophobia in the context of tourism and the outward migration of Caribbean people. You would think we would be equipped uh, to think about how do we accommodate migrants in our spaces. But migration remains a very contentious issue and I would argue that some of the global north language, the xenophobic attitudes get uh, really reinvested in different spaces. So for example, while Venezuelans are really hyper visible in the current moment for the Trinidad and Tobago context and indeed large parts of Latin America, they're certainly not the only migrants to experience xenophobia and deportation. 
Guyanese, Jamaicans, and Haitians are regularly singled out for deportation within the region and unfair, and unfair treatment in spite of CARICOM obligations and CSME supported freedom of movement and visiting visa agreements. In Trinidad in the past few years, we've seen many Venezuelans be deported, even in spite of work visas being allocated. Uh, just in November and December, there were lots of media reports around uh, 11 adults and a number of children who were sent back to Venezuela. Uh, and they were, they were in fact, all seeking asylum. And in fact, a court had to say, no, you can't, people are seeking asylum, you have to, they have to come back. But in the process of that, what I, uh, what I found really disturbing was the kind of public engagement with this action. Some people defended and people continue to defend. We've had many, many deportations over the past year. People defend deportations in the name of national interest, the state's inability to address crime, the needs of marginalized communities. And so we see xenophobic statements fill the media, public conversations with really conflicting reports about the deportations. Uh, courts have ordered asylum seekers to be returned. Uh, yet we see leaders repeat anti-migration talking points that are very common in the global north and cite sovereignty as the reason for not responding to the calls for humane treatment, international obligations, and asylum claims. Uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, Prime Minister Rowley really stoked the flames of xenophobia when he framed the appeals for the state to take more a co more compassionate approach to migrants and refugees as an attempt to, quote, grant them more rights than citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. And so this is where I wanted to point out some of these contradictions and hypocrisies and how xenophobia gets uh, fueled in different kinds of ways. And in the context of the pandemic, I think this has become even worse, right, as countries around the world are shoring up. But at the very same time, there were calls for migrant workers to come to Canada, right? We know that from Jamaica and from Trinidad and Tobago, people actually signed these COVID waivers to go and do work. In the case of Trinidad and Tobago, our borders are still closed. And so we know that a number of workers have been stuck as many other, uh, as many uh, Trinidad and Tobago nationals have been stuck somewhere uh, and not able to get back in with a very long, slow, painful process of trying to get an exemption to get back into the country. And in those cases, the public response has been fascinating. Some people are writing to advocate for different people. But when it comes to migrant workers who are doing farm work, I noticed the response was very much, oh, well, you left to go do work. And so, well, you know, you have to wait until the borders open. You're the one who left, right? And so the way that we think of sympathy for who is stuck uh, and who is not able to get help or support uh, has been quite, uh, quite disturbing. <clears throat> and so what I wanted us to do to also think about today is that how our own problems in the region, as I talk from the region, get cited as a justification for us not assisting migrants. Oh, we can't help people coming from Venezuela or Jamaica, et cetera. And of course, uh, countries in the region who have more migrants coming in are the countries that have higher um, income and have more, uh, have, have stronger economies. And so then, what? and that's one of the reasons why I think the, the same xenophobic language of, oh, we can't help everyone, uh, becomes a part of the discourse around migration. And yet what's interesting is that the same problems that are used to justify, oh, we can't help anyone, uh, you know, we see in the case, for example, in gender-based violence, little has really been done in terms of the state to address meaningfully some of the alarming rates and other forms of structural violence. And just recently in Trinidad and Tobago, we started the year with, uh, with alarming rates, more rates of femicides and gender-based violence, which uh, many organizations are calling on the state to do more. It's also, uh, I also wanted to think about how xenophobia becomes, a xenophobia becomes political and fueled. We know we can see that uh, in the discourses of the United States and Canada and Europe. Uh, but it also happens here, I think, in really dangerous ways. 
Uh, and the heart, at the heart of this migrant crisis, we see a really lack of coherent and expert informed action. Uh, a lot of the solutions are short term, oh, we'll do these work visas, but then no long term solutions uh, I've seen really come to the fore because it's all about that short term engagement. So the response remains weak. Uh, we use some of the same Global North narratives to frame our understanding. And, you know, every utterance of they're taking our jobs in this context, you know, should remind us that our claims to sovereignty are complicated and vexed through the failures of globalization and capitalism, working class struggles and foreign dependency, and of course, tourism dependency being a major part of that. And so, of course, we can understand how people's fears and anxieties become a part of the conversation. Uh, and the uncertainty due to the pandemic, I think it's fueled a lot of this uh, xenophobia and a lot of the anti-immigrant sentiment. Yet we also know because we live in those daily realities that migrant labor, uh, we rely upon it in informal and formal economies across the region. And at the same time in the region, we have our own desire to move with freedom. Uh, and so this is what I, I, I wanna wrap up in a couple of minutes that as we as as we think about these complex contradictions and think about what's happening in the region uh one of the things that we've been in terms of my work uh i want to point out these contradictions and get us to think about it differently and really question right like our region has long been known for so much outward migration and inward migration and how do we then create empathy around thinking about what about our family and relatives or ourselves who've migrated for different kinds of opportunities, why aren't we bringing that same logic with intra-Caribbean or South to South migration? But of course, we have to think about the anti-migrant and xenophobic sentiments in the context of violence, economic insecurity, racial and class violence, and the continued assault on the lives of women and girls across our region and indeed the world. Too often, when we make these connections, though, we're told, you know, we have to prioritize and focus on local issues or one issue at a time, but we don't live single issue lives. And as the black feminist poet Audre Lorde reminds us, you know, we have to think through, and this is what I'm arguing and have argued in my work, that we have to connect these tangled webs of intersecting violences and think about the lack of value that we place on poor lives, migrant lives, black lives, LGBTQI lives, women's lives, and children's lives. And these are all rooted, of course, in the historical legacies of colonial violence and racism. And so I'll close with just uh, an example of one of the public campaigns that I worked on uh, and was happy to, to support with Womantra, uh, an intersectional, uh, feminist organization here in Trinidad and Tobago that put out a campaign in 16 days of activism uh, from November 25th to December 10th called Thrive Together, a refugee rights campaign to raise awareness around cultural similarities, around connections, around understanding what terms like migrant and refugee mean, and to talk about the intersections uh, of violence and really focus on the Trinidadian and Venezuelan migrant communities and the connections. And so you can find it online and uh, if folks wanna ask me more questions about that. Um, and of course, I know we're not the only country that we, that deal, that, that how we manage and deal with these challenges. And I think that there are connections with how we have dealt with the politics of South to South migration. And, you know, I'll close by saying uh, what I've argued in my work and will continue to argue is that we need a Caribbean vision uh, a region and a regional vision that is about freedom of movement, that is about internal sustainability in terms of food, in terms of movement, in terms of how we think about ourselves as a region, how do we invest in ourselves from food production to creating different linkages across our social services, our economies, uh, and prioritizing and thinking about who makes decisions and prioritizing those most vulnerable from LGBT folks to GBV survivors, that's been my sort of visioning around how we can create change. And I'll close there. Thank you, wonderful Dr. Nixon. And I appreciate the, your, the time, the observation of the time we have. Um, 
I think considering the fact that we started uh, a little bit late, um, you're doing great. And we, I hope that we will have at least 30 minutes, that's uh, I hope so, for discussion. And I already see nine questions already, uh, there are many. And um, I hope that we will have some time, but I'm gonna ask uh, our panelists as well to try to respond if you can in Britain, in case we don't uh, have all the time to go over each questions. So thank you for that. Our last panelist uh, today, it's uh, Dr. Manuel Galavis from the University of Texas at Austin um, in the Department of Anthropology. Dr. Galavis is going to talk about entanglements of mobility and border security infrastructure projects in San Diego, California. Dr. Galavis, please. Hello, I'm going to share my screen here. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Um, and thank you to my colleagues, um, Dr. Kalanda, Chris, Dr. Nixon. Um, thank you for your, 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 your word, your knowledge for sharing that with us. Um, I'm actually quite excited and honored um, to be here. Uh, as as um, Miguel mentioned, I recently obtained my, my PhD. So this is my first presentation as, a, as with the title of Doctor of Philosophy behind it, um, which is um, quite remarkable. So thank you. Um, this is a wonderful place to, to be sharing um, what I, some of my work, some of the research with y'all. Uh, so, you know, how I came through this too was through Miguel um, saw the Lozano Long Institute of Latin American Studies posted that accomplishment and Miguel asked if I would um, be willing to share some of the, the information here. So, um, thank you, uh, Miguel. And also I'd like to thank um, CIRLAC, um, all the organizers for providing the space for us to have these discussions that are on a hemispheric level and very intersectional, I think, too. Um, so, the title of my presentation is um, Entanglements of Mobility and border security infrastructure projects in the San Diego Tijuana transborder region. And before I move on, I do um, want to acknowledge that the regions where I will be speaking about are um, Kumeyaay territories um, that actually exceed the Tijuana San Diego transborder region. They were split in pretty much half um, with the border that divides the United States from Mexico. And uh, this is the, the page um, of, I would say the handle for the Instagram page for um, Kumeyaay in defense of the wall. Um, who they've been in struggle of defending their lands from border construction, um, border wall constructions, particularly in the past year. So um, I do want to also say that um, I was born in Guadalajara, but um, San Diego, California is my home, um, where I was raised there as an undocumented youth for um, 14 years um, until I was 18 years old. Um, and I was four when I crossed the border. And when I crossed the border, my uncle, who was 14 at the time, actually carried me across the hills, the mountains, and as we try to evade the border patrol. So, you know, th this happened on a New Year's 1987, and every year since then, my uncle always kind of makes a, a point to either contact me or remind me that um, how long it's been since we've been in the United States, and but more specifically to remind me that it was him who who carried me across the border. And, um, and, and I'm actually quite um, grateful that he did so. Um, otherwise, I, I don't think I would be here with you all today um, being a part of this conversation. So, um, so I do share that information because um, those experiences are what shaped my scholarship, what shaped my interest in studying the United States Mexican borderlands. Um, and a lot of the questions that, I, that emerged um, through my scholarship were actually directly informed by um, having certain politics limit my mobility as an undocumented youth and realizing that in San Diego, um, I specifically um, was very vulnerable to deportation. And in San Diego, it's not so much that it's that the city itself is located near the border, but it's more that there is um, San Diego shares um, quite extensive amount of its territory with um, military bases, which are federal lands, which also represent um, sites of deportation, geographies of deportation. And in the same light, um, you have um, multiple checkpoints, border patrol checkpoints. And these are regions, again, that do present a certain risk of deportation for undocumented folks. Um, so that's kind of how I came to understanding the border and trying to understand um, issues of mobility. So I do find myself um, quite um, honored to have that opportunity to go 
as someone who's been an undocumented person and then later come back and be able to examine the border and have questions um, that were emerging as I was a youth. So at this point, I would invite um, those who are watching at home and those who have their mobile phones to actually um, scan this QR code down here and you can get a more detailed map of, um, of what I'm talking about when I mention um, these just the what these uh, border patrol checkpoints look like. The other map that you have here are of some of the military bases in San Diego. San Diego, um, more specifically, the county of San Diego is home to over seven military bases, and they themselves are actually sites of deportation because they're federal land. And if you accidentally arrive at one of their entrance gates, um, chances are that you're going to have to prove legality. Um, you're going to have to prove and provide identity. And these are located very strategically on um, the military bases on, um, located next to major roads and freeways. So again, it's very easy, very innocent mistake to take an exit off a freeway and be at a place where now you are eligible for deportation. So depending on time, I will, um, I might share an ethnographic um, eth um, vignette on a case that happened. So it's with um, these, um, so I, I bring all this up because um, these are, um, San Diego is my home. And like I said, I do consider myself very fortunate. And um, I'm actually, you know, when one of the, the year that I brought up um, when we crossed was 1987, which was a year after the 1986 immigration reform, the Immigration Reform and Control Act was implemented in the United States. And that granted um, 2.7 million undocumented immigrants in the United States um, a residency, but at the same time, it doubled the funding for um, border patrol enforcement. So that's when you start seeing the emergence of more border security infrastructures in um, specifically in the San Diego Tijuana transborder region. And one of the, when I bring this up because uh, one of the manuscripts that I'm working on for a book manuscript is, um, which is titled Entanglements of Mobility, Border Security, and Militarized Ecologies, I'm really working through life histories of, of again that deal with my family's um, trajectory through these landscapes and, and other folks that were part of my community and putting them in, in conversation with the growth of border security infrastructure projects in these regions and, um, and really just talking about the emergence and the changes that have taken place on the land um, and the lands I would say um, in this in this area. So with all that said, um, I want to invite you all to remember summer 2020 and specifically in the city, the US city of Portland, Oregon, uh, which garnished a lot of attention. And one of the reasons it garnished all this attention was because federal agents were actually um, apprehending folks without a warrant. Um, they were detaining and a lot of the demonstrators who were out there in support of black lives and specifically protesting um, police brutality. And for those of us who were at the border, we were actually, um, I would say we were rejoiced that this was happening and not so much because it was a violation of human rights or anything like that, but because of the racial politics that were involved with this, because to all of, to those of us who have been living in the United States Mexican borderlands, who study the United States Mexican borderlands, we understand that constitutional rights are always violated in these regions in terms of federal agents having the ability to arrest someone based on um, based on a category simply of looking like you're illegal or looking like you're an illegal immigrant. And that's usually very much racialized. And I did have something written up here, but I think I'm just gonna keep, keep speaking the way I am. And again, this is one of the, what we live in San Diego, California, specifically we live with um, different border security infrastructures, but more precisely with um, border patrol just about in every public space that we try to occupy, that we try to move about. Um, these are images of San Diego, various locations in San Diego. One of the image that you see here is of the ocean where the border fence actually goes into the, the Pacific Ocean um, at Friendship Park. And this is an image that you might be familiar with and different, you know, seen across different mediums and different meet levels. And this is a site where I would actually spent a lot of time in conducting research with um, park rangers in terms of access and different forms of people who are being um, monitored at this park. And the other images you see are, um, one is at Chicano Park, just that show you a mural that's at Chicano Park in San Diego. And that's a mural um, that, as you can read, it says no border wall. And this is the, the momentum that's at that park is this uh, fighting against this um, surveillance, this border wall, the border, the presence of border patrol agents. And 
another image is also um, here with the band, the Border Patrol band is of Chicano Park again, but this is a Border Patrol band leaving the park. Um, and as you may know, um, and, and for those of you who might not be familiar with, um, Chicano is, um, I'm not gonna say it's a, it's a basic term of Mexican American, but it is folks who are pretty much um, of Mexican origin or perhaps of Latinx origin and um, identify as Chicano. So there is a racial component as to why um, there is a presence of border patrol in these public park spaces. And um, something that's also located here, um, this is the San Clemente checkpoint for, so those of you who actually um, scan the QR code, um, this is one of the checkpoints that you see there. It's located off the Interstate 5 freeway. And the, free, um, the checkpoints are actually sites of, again, as I mentioned, deportations. Um, these are sites where um, folks who are trying to just navigate through the roads um, have to pass through. And how you're inspected at these is very much up to the discretion of the Border Patrol agent. Um, they can either allow you to go through or they can stop you. And there's so many elements, so many registers that have to go through that. A lot of them are essentially based on race, color, and um, class, um, things that might seem as minute as um, your car seems a little dirty, or perhaps um, even things as if you are a brown man um, driving a car on your own, that might raise some suspicion because they might think that you're transporting drugs. If you're in a van, um, that's always gonna draw suspicion. Um, in fact, um, it's, it's almost very much um, a running joke that you shouldn't cross this checkpoint or go up to regions like Los Angeles because you have to cross through this specific checkpoint in a van, specifically a large van, because that will um, pretty much make you a suspect or will create that um, inconvenience if you can, if you um, actually have documents to to go back and forth between the US, um, it'll create some kind of distance where you'll be racially profiled because of your, the car that you're driving. So what gives um, these immigration and border patrol agents, these federal agents, the power to really um, apprehend people in these lands? Well, it's something that the American Civil Liberties Union has called the Constitution Free Zone. Um, this is also known as the United States border area. And in this um, border area, it's actually, um, it's the border patrol agents and other federal agents who can become deputized um, by, again, anyone who is um, who has any authority by the Department of Homeland Security can actually apprehend anyone without a warrant. Acting without a warrant, they can stop and ask you um, for your documents, ask you for some form of ID, and they can detain you. And of course, this is used for border security. Um, and what people, um, I think, sometimes don't understand is that um, the border area is not necessarily relegated to just the regions um, adjacent to the to Mexico. Um, they're actually um, all the boundaries of the United States. So as you can see, the um, boundaries are considered um, such as areas as the water. So the Pacific Ocean is a boundary and 100 miles inland, that would be a region where um, border agents can actually apprehend someone. And similarly, um, the border with Canada also shares this kind of distinction with, um, with uh, uh, border agents have that kind of authority and power, but it really is the place where um, these types of apprehensions take place are pretty much at the southern border with um, with Mexico, and I bring all this up because um, you know it's it's something that I think is uh, very important to to analyze and to think about is um, just what this creates and does to the United States, where it does create two separate geographies: one where um, constitutional rights are structuring um, law enforcement, and on the other end where um, they're completely annulled, they're completely denied, and um, anyone can really become suspect. So when I gave that example of Portland, Oregon, when some of us were rejoicing, it was because we were hoping that that would deflect some of the, um, some light or some some light or perhaps some shed some transformative justice into how um, people are treated, specifically people of Mexican um, descent, people of, of Mexican origin or Central American origin, or people who are simply um, brown, dark skinned individuals um, are treated in the United States Mexican border. Um, some of the things that they have to deal with um, as they as they are trying to just navigate or go to work or perhaps um, just trying to live um, a dignified life in these regions. And you know, San Diego County, as as those of you who scanned the QR code are, are realizing, um, are just full of border patrol checkpoints. And I, at this point, I really want to stop and um, give um, credit to my wife, um, Sarah Garcia, and also my father, um, Rigoberto Galaviz, who um, helped me create this map. Um, 
Sarah provided the, um, the knowledge behind the digital humanities to really bring this forward and, um, and have you all have that QR code to scan. And then uh, my father was also provided a lot of the knowledge of some of these checkpoints, which are um, in very rural um, isolated roads. So, um, so these are some of the things I wanted to share with you. Um, but at the same time, um, I wanna share um, a, quick, a quick ethnographic vignette that has to do with um, someone being detained at, um, and actually not necessarily a border patrol checkpoint, but as I mentioned, a military checkpoint. Um, so this has to do um, about an encounter that happened um, at a carne asada, at a barbecue, at someone's barbecue. So as he approached me with a beer in hand, he noticed that I'd been paying close attention to the song that his wife had been singing. He asked, ¿Le está poniendo cabrón la cosa con este viejo, verdad, meño? And basically, what he's saying that things are getting really bad with this old man, referring to Trump, um, and menu is how I'm called um, in, in, this, in this area. And by asking that particular question, um, Pancho invited Trump, and more precisely, the theme of current immigration border issues to the conversation. And usually, when I would hear someone bring up Trump or border issues, things um, usually related to, um, usually related to, um, well, when Trump was conjured up as conversation that usually would follow with stories about immigration detention or what the current issues or people's um, would share anecdotes of when they were detained or deported at some point. Um, so really Trump was really synonymous with this uncertainty that was happening. That was happening. So um, as it turns out, you know, as we were talking, um, it turns out that Pancho had been deported um, after accidentally driving into a military checkpoint he had been sharing the story by first asking if I knew that he had been deport, apprehended at Camp Pendleton. And I didn't, of course, um, that's one of the largest Marine um, um, military bases. And I didn't, of course, um, but the way he phrased it in his question in Spanish was, Sabias que me pararon en Pendleton? Did you know I was stopped in Pendleton? Clearly emphasizing the process of halting his mobility through the act of his apprehend, apprehension. He didn't say the exact year of his deportation and said he identified it as a time in terms of monumental transitions in immigration policy. His deportation occurred before La Reforma del 86, before the implementing of IRCA of 1986 and the birth of his eldest daughter. Um, so he was going to go pick up his um, wife in Oceanside, which you see the image there where the city's at, um, who was arriving via a bus um, after visiting her family in Los Angeles and he missed his um, exit. And as he missed his exit, he ended up um, at the entrance gate um, that you see here for um, the Marines. And when he arrived at, at this um, exit, at this um, checkpoint, which is essentially a checkpoint, um, he realized that he was gonna have to prove and show his ID, which he didn't have an ID. And at that specific moment, um, he just told the Marines, hey, look, I'm undocumented. Um, you know, do what you have to do. And then they were like, okay, so they detained him for two hours at the Marines um, stop. And he actually describes it as something that was quite pleasant because um, he was, you know, he said that they just sat him in a bench somewhere and that, that it was at night. So some of the Marines, some of the soldiers that were there went and pretty much shared cigarettes with him and they would just talk. And at the time he was driving a Trans Am and at Trans Am actually became the focal point of their conversation. Um, he did say that two hours later, the border patrol arrived and that they were actually more aggressive with them. They were the ones who were actually pushing them around and handcuffed them. And he got deported immediately that night. Um, and at that specific moment, he said something that was, I thought was very interesting. That was, um, he said, you know, he said that he was deported that afternoon or that night and he was able to be back home the following day. And of course, this was in the 19, late 1980s. And he said um, pretty much that that can't, couldn't happen today and that that's something that just wouldn't be um, a possibility to be deported one night and then be in Tijuana, a city like Tijuana, and then be able to cross back. Um, simply, there's just too many, um, for, again, these border security infrastructures in the area that are very detrimental to um, not only just like the ecologies of the region, but also again, to just these migrations that have historically been a part of the United States and Mexico. So, you know, I, I do want to share that because he was telling me the story and I was, um, you know, quite intrigued and, and, and made it into my dissertation. And as I was doing field work in San Diego, having researched the border, having researched um, borderlands, having heard multiple accounts of people who had been arrested at military bases, I um, made the mistake and uh, took a left turn and ended up at a naval hospital. 
and at the Naval Hospital, there was an actual um, detention spot, and that's my alarm, but I was essentially, um, I was essentially had to prove that I was legal, I had to show my ID, and at that specific moment, I realized that, again, these inspection stations are, um, can emerge at any point in a migrant's life, um, and these are, again, just contribute to these um, geographies of deportation. So again, thank you on my emails here. And um, if you want to learn more, I have another QR code that links to um, a, a blog that recently came out today. So thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel, and congratulations again. Uh, we are really uh, appreciative of your time and everyone else in the panel. Angelique, Evelyn, Chris, thank you very much for your, uh, for your presentations. Uh, we do have uh, about 20 more minutes or so. It is really short. Uh, we were hoping to finish before 8 p.m., but I think considering the, the fact that we started uh, late, uh, I just want to give you the opportunity to respond to the questions. There are many questions. Uh, and so, uh, thank you, Angelique. She has already responded to some of the questions in the chat in the uh, Q&A section. Uh, I would like to perhaps start with uh, questions for Evelyn and Chris. Uh, you did receive a, a few. And, uh, and I think you have access to them. But um, so as you respond, Evelyn and Chris, if you don't mind, you can, we can start with you both and maybe just read aloud the question. So, um, or uh, attendees will sort of uh, be engaged with, uh, with your answers. But I just wanted to say, thank you everyone. I've seen a very uh, uh, engaged audience tonight, considering, considering the time and considering that we also got disconnected at some point. But thank you very much. Your questions are, are superb. And I think they reflect the fact that we have covered substantive ground with regard to uh, multiple dimensions of immigration, uh, from security securitization to the life, uh, precarious lives of uh, seasonal agricultural workers. And um, so why don't we do that, Evelyn and Chris, let's start with you. Uh, and then uh, we move into with, uh, to Angelique and uh, some questions for Manuel, I think, at the end of the uh, Q&A. Cool. So I'm going to start off with the first two questions. Uh, with respect to the poultry industry, um, our experience has been mostly with chicken catchers. Uh, we have a, a substantial population of chicken catchers that come from uh, Jamaica, Guatemala, Philippines, Thailand, and they're all, it's always rotational. Um, so uh, our organizing with, with, um, with chicken catchers has been on and off for many years, and partly it's because of the geographic and the continued, um, continued moving. And a lot of times what we see after their contracts are done, uh, they're basically sent back home. And um, especially workers from the Southeast Asia, we lose, we lose contact with them. Uh, but in the past, we've made tremendous inroads um, and we've had lots of contact with chicken catchers, uh, particularly through the Asian Community Aid Services, who's been doing a lot of work with Thai and Filipino work workers. So um, our connection um, has been with them. Uh, but we're also seeing during COVID a lot of um, inability to reach to workers, right? So they're facing, as I mentioned beforehand, a lot of um, mobility restrictions and actually having the ability to, uh, to go, to co coordinate, to organize with has been difficult. We've been providing some um, some of the food components, but the next step is going to be a much longer process. With respect to data, uh, honestly, at this moment, we can't tell you because a lot of this data isn't provided. It's not upfront about what the breakdown is of, um, of industries. But um, just to close on this thing, I want us to remember that race very much defines what crop or what what um, part of the agricultural industry uh, that you may or may not work in. Uh, historically, um, we saw a shift in the 80s and 90s from tobacco to ginseng and other crops. And tobacco workers were predominantly Caribbean workers. And when tobacco started to go under, the buyouts started happening, the multi-billion dollar lawsuits, the majority of those tobacco workers who were black men lost their jobs. It's not that they basically shifted to other crops. They just weren't called back when their farms went under. So race plays a defining and critical role in the occupational segregation that, that exists. So that's that. The DNA question. Uh, so in 2013, um, a few friends of mine were, um, had contacted me and there was a sexual assault that happened in a community just outside of Tilsonburg, Ontario. And what the Ontario Provincial Police did is they had a general description of a quote unquote black male. 
They took every um, Trinidadian, Jamaican, D Dominican worker, which was approximately 99 workers. Didn't matter what they look, if they met the definition, whatever. They coerced them to undertake a DNA test, right? So, uh, so they were put in the back of a vehicle. Their DNA was taken. After that, they were forced to sign something, uh, acknowledging, giving permission for this to happen. The one worker, um, well, there's two workers, but the one worker who did try to stand up for his rights was not called back the following year to work at that place. And it was promised by the police that the, uh, the, 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 the DNA information would be um, destroyed. So we started to organize with those workers. Uh, we did uh, first a police oversight complaint. We found out through that process that, the, in fact, anybody who's involved in a serious uh, case, serious crime, and this is literally hundreds of people, um, not just the migrant workers, uh, but people who have been had their DNA taken, this information is kept forever. It's not. So we've undertaken three things. There's an organizing component, of course. We've undertaken a class action against the state, and we're doing a human rights case for 54 workers. But just this form of surveillance, this form of control, the ability that they thought that they can get away with this because it's a rural black community in the middle of nowhere. So they thought they'll be silent and they could get away with it. So, you know, kudos to the workers for wanting to stand up uh, with that. I'll now turn it over to Evelyn. Okay, um, well, thank you for your questions. And I have to say that many of the questions could be, um, you know, entire dissertation topics or MA thesis. So I can't speak to all of them. I'm gonna speak to the ones that resonated uh, for me a lot. Um, well, the first one is, um, I'll start with the easy one. How can you get involved in Justicia? Mm -hmm. Please uh, reach out to us. Um, we need all of your, whatever skills that you have, including skills for um, our digital work. Uh, we definitely need help with that. We have an excellent social media team that is behind our Instagram account, Harvesting Freedom, that know technology more than Chris and I that we've been around for so long. And, and so we have new blood in, our, in Justicia that are taking our work um, to, you know, to other horizons. Um, so please get in touch. Um, well, the question about um, that tension and contradiction of decolonization and claiming and fighting for status is a very real one. And I'm not gonna be able to resolve that right now in, in the response that I'm gonna give you. But in order for us to dive into that question appropriately, we have to remember that migrant workers themselves, a great majority of them um, from Mexico and Guatemala are indigenous and that a great amount of them are also in, from communities um, that mining corp Canadian mining corporations have destroyed. And, um, and so what we need to do is, we need to see that it's not just migrant workers from particular nation states, it's migrant workers from particular nations that are being displaced and utilized by capital. So we have to keep you know, the framework of capitalism that is constantly um, creating um, or constructing precarity among nations of peoples, you know, within the hemisphere. So we need to really look at, you know, our work beyond borders and look at the uh, what is um, and look and look at all of these issues in a more grand in the grand scheme of things, and hold you know this capitalism, this vengeful vengeful capitalism that is creating demi sense um, out of entire communities and nations. And what we need is to also um, create more linkages between the indigenous communities here in Canada. And then we also can't get over the fact that as settler colonists, uh, co uh, colonialists, uh, settlers here in, in Canada, a lot of us in Justicia were displaced from our home countries to begin with because of imperialism. So we are working with all those contradictions. And every time that we also approach the Canadian states, and ask for rights, in many ways, we're reinforcing that state because we are, we are, what we're actually trying to do behind everything that we do is we're trying to claim the humanity of our communities, of our migrant communities, because they're constantly dehumanized. So yes, we're in this contradictory space. It's important to have those conversations um, but we can't, cannot forget that migrant workers, they come from cultures that have been um, here in this hemisphere long before European or other settlements. So we can't you know, discount that at all. And uh, one of the things that I wanna do in my research moving forward is analyze what does it mean to be Mayan and rural 
Ontario? You know, what does it mean to wear your corte in the middle of, you know, the winter at a Tim Hortons? How, how do you navigate? How do migrant workers that come from, um, from Mayan cultures, how do they navigate who they are? And especially now I, I, I've been speaking to um, some Mayan workers who, have, who are telling me that a lot of the elders in their communities are dying. And so, you know, now they're gonna become the elders, but then they're the elders that are in the temporary foreign worker program. They're here also in legal limbo in their lives. Um, and lastly, I'll just stop so that we, we all have a chance to speak. Um, the criteria that the Mexican government and also the Jamaican government, they all basically have their own criteria of selection that is very, very problematic. Um, many times uh, with the migrant women before they come to Canada, they are, they are forced to sign a waiver that they're not, they're not going to engage sexually with um, other men in the program. And the whole framework of the program is very heterosexist to begin with. Um, so yes, that is a huge problem. Um, if, you know, I invite um, all of you, if you haven't, to watch Migrant Dreams. In Migrant Dreams, we feature, well, um, directed by Min Sook Lee, and um, we feature a story of a queer, you know, I remember it was the weekend or the week of, of uh, Pride in Toronto, and I thought, forget Pride in Toronto, we were celebrating, um, you know, a queer marriage in rural Ontario among two temporary foreign workers. So, um, so, so in that program, there's less surveillance from the part of, well, in the recruitment side. Um, and the um, selection process is a little bit much more open. Um, it's not based on, on how many children you have. Um, it's not so heterosexist, but, um, but they also go through other things such as having, been, having to uh, be beholden not just to their employer, but to their labor contractors at the same time. But all of these programs, no matter what, um, I want to go back to what Chris says, workers fight back. And you know what we had to do along the years is to also train ourselves to look at how resistance, the different forms of resistance um, that workers take on. It's not just a matter of um, organizing a union because they can't, right? It's not you know, that they necessarily have a protest um, outside of Leamington, which we actually have had something, we've had those um, actions as well, but we have to pay closer attention at, in the creative ways that migrant workers assert themselves. And in my work, I also talk about how, um, how even the act of loving in this framework of unfreedom becomes an act of resistance and human and exclamation of humani humanity in itself. So, you know, so it's our job as organizers and um, activists and scholars, you know, to um, show and, and document to our communities, mostly our writing is for our communities as well, that they are powerful, they are resisting. And one day I hope that, uh, well, the thing that keeps me going is that uh, one day I want the Canadian government to apologize to migrant workers and their families. And I'm not gonna stop until they actually do. Thank you. Just uh, quickly to respond, I guess, just to two more questions. Um, I think there's the commercial trade agreements are a problem. I think we start to have this to, to start thinking about uh, with what Dr. Nixon said, the freedom of movement of people, not the freedom of capital. And how do we replace uh, cap commercial trade agreements? And I agree with William um, about the right to housing. And I think we need to think of migrant housing as a common good, as a public good, and not something that should be deferred to the, uh, the, the power of growers. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, Dr. Nixon, please. And uh, it's, um, it's just a few minutes before eight, and I really want to uh, save some time to uh, allow Dr. Uh, Daniel uh, Robinson, uh, Sarlacc Director, to, to give our final words. But we want to have some time for Dr. Nixon and Manuel to respond to some of your questions. Uh, yeah, because it's I received. Okay, I'll just jump in quickly, uh, building on what Evelyn said, when I think about resistance for, for the region, it is resisting capitalism, it's resisting tourism dependency, foreign dependency, the conditions which give rise to the reason why people are migrating to begin with. And so for me, I'm thinking about how we prevent the uh, migratory flows that are happening. How do we create a region and where we're building each other up? And so we don't have these hierarchies of who 
are the good migrants versus you know the migrant workers versus the um, all the ways in which different flows are happening and that migrants can get scapegoated uh, and I want to say too that Esther Figueroa asked a really great question how do we hold how do we talk about the governments of the region who are allowing these programs like Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago and others I mean I think that's for us to also hold our governments accountable to say why are you doing this but we also understand the double bind uh, of our economies people are reliant upon remittances right and and so and and there maybe there aren't there there are so many different reasons right for why a government would approve such a program and so we need to really get at that place of how do we how do we really achieve liberation sustainability uh, and and finish you know and pursue deco decolonization in a serious way through you know through all of our systems so I mean I think that that's the most important way for us to think about it and to in to encourage these kinds of conversations because I think that's also super important my work is about doing that sensitization how do we talk about migration how do we talk about xenophobic attitudes how do we talk about migrant issues migrant sex workers how do we talk about these different things uh, in our um, societies and to, to gain sensitivity uh, and to understand uh, our experiences and think of ourselves uh, regionally. So I'll close there. Thank you very much. Uh, Manuel, please. Yeah, thank you, Miguel. And, um, I want to. Uh, there is a question asking um, in relation to um, the landscape and, and that weaponization of the landscapes. And, and yeah, um, San Diego was in 1994 um, Operation Gatekeeper introduced um, pretty much what you see now, that border fence that dives into the Pacific Ocean. Um, before that, it wasn't necessarily, and there was still a border, but that wasn't necessarily there. Um, so to address that specific question in the Q&A, but I wanna um, take this moment and um, uh, about a year ago, I, I was in Vancouver and um, I heard a, a representative of the Mexican consulate um, talk about the guest worker program and um, they painted a completely different picture than what uh, Evelyn and Chris have, have introduced today. So. Um, you know, when, when and, and Dr. Nixon, when you mentioned you know, how do we hold these um, groups accountable, I think it's it's in these kind of um, areas that we need to question them and be like, okay, like you telling me something on the state level, but what is it really on the ground? So I, I do appreciate all your, you all, um, my colleagues' um, work and insights. Um, I learned a lot from all of you. I was taking notes as, as I was going along. So, um, and also, um, you know, a lot of the instances that Evelyn, um, Dr. Encanta, you presented um, were in many ways heartbreaking and um, do offer um, in some ways, um, you know, I was I was looking at, at, at connections, um, hearing stories of migrant struggles of migrant farm workers in California, um, specifically stories told to me um, in in um, by one of my neighbors whose mother actually convinced uh, one of these farm workers during the Bracero program to um, to um, start cooking for the the, the um, workers and introducing foods that were locally and not uh, locally from their regions and knowledgeable of and just how, how that changed the environment and, um, and just the social change it created there. So again, thank you for, for that work that y'all are doing. Thank you very much. Um, no, thank, thank you for uh, this amazing panel um, to Angelique, Manuel, Evelyn, and Chris, and honestly for attending our call. I think it was an amazing uh, group of scholars and activists that um, that you share your work with all of us, and we we feel very fortunate. And I, and I think I can speak for a Sir like the Sir like community. It's been a wonderful night, and um, and thanks for your uh, kindness in responding to the questions, uh, both in live but also in written forms, and for sharing additional resources. I think it's important for us to remain engaged. Uh, so thank you again for for this wonderful night. And now uh, it's almost uh, eight, so we still have four minutes. I'm gonna pass it on to uh, Dr. Daniel Robinson, who is our CERLAC director. And, uh, and uh, she came up, I have to say, she came up with the idea of, instead of organizing a single um, lecture for the Baptista, which is, uh, used to be uh, the norm, used to be the, um, the practice at CERLAC, she uh, proposed that we instead have, since we're living pandemic times, to do a series of virtual panels uh, on, on themes that relate to the core mission of CERLAC. And I think it's been a wonderful idea uh, and something that has worked so far. This is our second panel. And uh, we're looking forward to a third panel on the, um, on the question of reparation in the uh, Latin American region. 
But um, Daniel, please. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel, and um, thank you, everyone. There's there's so many people behind the scenes who made this evening possible. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank Angelique, Evelyn, Chris, and Manuel for your incredible presentations and work that you do. I want to thank everyone who came out tonight for your thoughtful questions. Um, Krista, Camila, Kafia, you are the hands that made this all possible. So thank you and honor and Miguel. There's no way this could have happened without you um, and the vision that you brought to these events and the, the people that you've been able to bring together to have these important conversations. So thank you for that. Um, I'm just gonna say a couple more things. Um, Honor wanted to jump in and finish her, um, her comments from the beginning just briefly. Um, I'm gonna share two, th two links in the chat. The first is to an open letter that's been put out by the Migrant Rights Network um, it's a cross Canada campaign to ensure migrant workers are getting prioritized in the COVID-19 vaccines. So please go to this website and sign their open letter. Secondly, um, we have a student conference coming up in two weeks. The theme is recognition, agency and deservingness, reframing refugee, black and indigenous movements. It's a virtual student conference. It's two days. February 26th and 27th. It's a free conference. You're all welcome. Your students are welcome. I've looked at the, um, the plan and it's really incredible what these students have been able to put together. It's the students of Surlac and the students of the Center for Refugee Studies. Um, I don't know how they put this incredible panel together, but um, please come and support them. And, and uh, I think you'll, I think it's a wonderful way to continue the conversation that we started tonight together. And um, at this point, I'll pivot over to Honor, who had just a couple more things she wanted to say um, to, to send us off. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Danielle. Hi, everybody. Um... I just had a couple of comments. Well, I really enjoyed the mixture of, um, of sort of internal and external, um, the dialogue about what's happening in the Imperial North and also linking it to what's happening in the Global South and linking the, uh, what's happening in the Caribbean to also what's happening with migrant workers on the ground here who are from the Caribbean and Mexico and, um, and um, the situation in the US. So that was that was really inspiring to hear. But what I wanted to say is that it is Black History Month and we at CERLAC are reflecting on this in relation to the needs of Black and Caribbean studies in, in the present context. So we will be hosting a couple of panels on reparations as the next two panels in the Batista series. The first one is going to look at the campaign for reparations in the Anglophone Caribbean, and it'll be in March. So we're asking you to um, keep your eyes open for the blast of publicity that's going to begin shortly. We're going to be having people from the region who are working on the campaign, as well as local activists here in Canada and historians. And the second one in the series is going to broaden the issue beyond the Anglophone Caribbean to look at the question of reparations globally and to also talk about the legal framework for it. So we'll be trying to follow up how these issues impact Brazil, which has the biggest black diaspora in the hemisphere and the US. And we'll also try to loop in um, parts of the continent of Africa. So the idea here is to generate a broad discussion and a reasoning, which borrowing from Robin Kelly, we might loosely call a reasoning about freedom dreams. We want to supplement these public discussions with our own internal reflections on how we might rethink Caribbean studies in the present moment in relation to Black struggles and in relation to Indigenous struggles. So we hope you will join us um, for the next uh, two panels in the series. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Manuel. Good night. Thank you, Thank Evelyn. You. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you, Wonderful. Angelique. Thank you so much. Thank you. So much. Thank you.